our worship service. Stay tuned. Come on, have some church with us today. God bless. Well, praise God and thank you for joining us again uh, for this communion service Sunday. I'm going to pray. Father God, thank you for your anointing so far. But Lord, we need a word from you. Father, I ask you to touch someone's heart to let them know that you already know what they need and you've already planned to send it. So Lord, let the words of my mouth, what comes out of me, not be me, unless it's sanctioned through your anointing. Bless us now as we read your holy word and preach and teach your gospel. In Jesus' name, amen. Acts chapter 3. Acts chapter 3. We're going to look today at about eight verses of Acts chapter 3, the book of Acts. I'm reading from a New International Version. One day, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer at three in the afternoon. Now, a man who was lame from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg from those going to the temple courts. When he saw Peter and John about to enter in, he asked them for money. Peter looked straight at him as John did. Then Peter said, look at us. So the man gave them attention, expecting to get something from them. Then Peter said, silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ, of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Taking him by the right hand, he helped him up, and instantly the man's feet and ankles began became strong. He jumped to his feet and began to walk. Then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. For as long as the Spirit of the Lord will allow, I'm going to speak from this thought today, clarifying the power of that you possess, clarifying or being clear about the power that you possess. What made Nelson Mandela know who he was or have so much faith in who he was that he went from being a prisoner to being president to being a Nobel Peace Prize winner in the same country that had imprisoned him as a uh, countless or citizen, classless citizen. Nelson Mandela spent 27 years in prison from 1964 to 1982. He was locked in the Robbins prison on Cape Town in South Africa. He was in prison because he was a part of, part of the ANC, the African National Congress. As a matter of fact, he was president at one time, but then moved into the most militant branch that went around with covert attacks against this government that had instituted the evil system of apartheid. And so time will not permit for me to tell you everything that Nelson Mandela did, but he was so successful at these attacks that he was given the name of Black Pimpernel. And when he was finally caught and imprisoned, he was so influential that the government tried to give him freedom several times, but on the terms that he would compromise his position and Mandela turned them down. He said, first of all, on the premise that Free men negotiate. I'm locked up. I don't have any freedom to negotiate with. So Nelson Mandela believed in his heart, watch this, that he, his path to life lied in the fact that he was supposed to help set his people free. In 1990, he was set free. 1994, he became the president of this same country because of his understanding of who and what he was supposed to do. Listen to one of his famous quotes from his inaugural speech. Our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light, not our darkness, that most frightens us. We ask ourselves, who am I to be brilliant, gorgeous, talented, or fabulous? Actually, who are you not to be? You are a child of God 
Playing small doesn't serve the world. I hope you heard that. He said, why in the world should you play small? He did not play small. What made Mother Teresa become the greatest, most accomplished missionary we've ever had in this world? A young girl coming from poor and small beginnings, but she had a commitment to service because of the vows that she had made. As a matter of fact, she was called, uh, watching the progressions of her life, she was Mother Teresa, she was Saint Teresa from Calcutta, she was Saint Mother Teresa. All of that embodied her zeal and the way she went about serving and blessing poor people. She always would talk about something that was her inspiration. It was called the call in her call. She said, I was called to something, but then I embraced that call and a new call and a new thirst for God came out of it. And she talks about how that thirst for God got her to the place that she helped countless thousands of people. She opened up missionaries. She worked with lepers. She worked with those no one else wanted to work with. She was so powerfully attached to the word of God that she is actually attributed to two supernatural miracles are attributed to her. The first one was she prayed for a woman that had a, a, a blockage in her abdomen. Uh, Mother Teresa touched her, prayed for her, and it's reported that the woman was healed by the power of the prayer. Another prayer was there was a man that had a brain tumor. Apparently she touched him and prayed for them. So much so that this first miracle led to her beautification in the Catholic faith, meaning it's the first step towards sainthood in 2003. And then the second miracle was recognized. Uh, she was canonized on September the 4th, 2016, posthumously. But she actually became a saint because of what she did. This young lady with small beginnings took a vow and never looked that. Listen to her testimony, which was a foundational quote of who she was. By blood, I am Albanian. By citizenship, an Indian. By faith, I am a Catholic nun. As to my calling, I belong to the world. As to my heart, I belong entirely to Jesus Christ. And finally, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, brilliant scholar, commanding and articulate preacher and a fighter for the rights and freedom of all men, but especially he turned the civil rights movement around an academic. He actually graduated from Morehouse and then went to uh, Crozier Theological Seminary in Pennsylvania and then finally getting a PhD in 1955 from Boston University. Dr. Martin Luther King at the young age of 24 in 19, 25 in 1954, he actually became the pastor of Dexter Avenue Baptist Church in Montgomery, Alabama and the rest is history. Come on, you know the story from Montgomery boycotts to the March on Washington, constantly getting death threats, constantly jail, constantly belittled, but he never gave up. And Dr. King is another one that said, I know my purpose. I know why I'm here. I know what I'm supposed to do. He was clear about what it was. People who worked with him were mesmerized by his stamina and that he would not relent even in the midst of death threats. And Right before the day before he died, this speech was given, and you know it well, I'm only going to say a little of it, but every one of the quotes kind of embody what these people thought about. And the mountaintop speech is a seminal moment in us understanding what it means to have clarification. Well, I don't know what will happen now. We've got some difficult days ahead. But it doesn't matter because I've been to the mountaintop. I don't mind like anybody else. I would like to live a long life. Longevity has its place. But I'm not concerned about that now. I just want to do God's will. And he has allowed me to go to the mountaintop. And I've looked over it. I've seen the promised land. I may not get there with you. But I want you to know as a people, we will get to the promised land. I am happy tonight. I'm not worried about anything. I'm not fearing any man. My eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord, three ordinary people with extraordinary lives by embracing and understanding who they were. Somewhere in their life, there was a clarification. This is what I possess. This is what God wants me to do. And a clear moment of power came through. This is the problem. Most saints do not have that moment of clarification. Listen to me. You're suffering through some things that you have the power to overcome, but you have not clarified what you possess. We, we do it in a general way. We listen to some preacher. But have you 
Have that moment with God where you say to yourself, this is who I am. This is what I'm here for. When that clarification moment comes, you will then be able to understand and possess that anointing to do the will of God. Most of us are like this man who went on a cruise. He gathered the last of his money, went on a luxury cruise, and then he took a little bag of food with him, went down to his room or his cabin, and while there, most of the time when the meals were taken, he would stay in his room and eat and munch off the food that he bought. But one day, the person living next to him in the other room came and said, hey, I never see you up at the breakfast. Man, the table is spread. I never see you at the lunches. I mean, they have lunch everywhere and the dinners are exquisite. All you can eat. And the man looked at him who stayed in his cabin and said, um, uh, well, I don't have any more money. He said, money, when you bought your ticket, everything was included in your ticket. You've been sitting around living like a pauper when you have everything on the inside you need, somebody sitting there devoid, you got enough power right now to pray yourself free. You got enough power right now to anoint your house and be free. You got enough power now to handle whatever situation is confronting you. But you have to have that moment of clarification. That's what this text is about. Watch this. Acts chapter 3 verse 6, our text. There's a verse there where Peter and John said unto this lame man, he said, look on us, silver and gold we don't have, but what I have, I give unto you. What I have, I give unto you. There it is. This was so powerful. When I'm reading this text, I'm like everyone else. We get fixated or we watch the miracle of the blind, of the lame man being healed. Come on. You know, we all see he was walking and leaping and praising God. And we all talk about that. But God hit me with such an anointing when he said they knew what they possessed. Look what the text said. Such as I have. That's clear. I know what I have in the name of Jesus. I know what he, it was so clear. We got to make sure we understand. Here is my thesis. My thesis said the miracle that we jump around on, the miracle that we see would never have happened if they had not had a moment of clarity about the power they possess. Yes, it would. You got to go with me. It would not have happened because right now, some of you, if you ever got a moment of clarity about who you are, about the power you possess, you would not let the enemy hold you the way they do. You would not let the enemy snatch and steal things from your family. You would stand up boldly and say what Peter and John say. I don't have silver and gold. I might not have all that stuff you have, but what I have. I clearly understand. They were past the point of hope so, maybe so, if it's going to be so. And they went to the place that they understood who they were. A time for clarification. The anointing is in you. You got to move all the junk out the way and clarify who you are. So when the battle starts, you're ready for the battle. Are you ready for this? This is a revelation fresh from God telling me to share with you. Do you know what you possess? Do you know why you're here? And it's not all of this supernatural stuff. It has to be done by faith. Simple. Somebody said, that's Peter and John. Peter and John were so flawed. Here's what we need to understand. Everybody has to go through the same battles to get to the same results. And here is where we know our power lies, how we tap into our possession, how we clarify who we are, we still got to do it by faith. There's no magic bullet. Through the ups and downs and the problems, we had a Nelson Mandela in prison. We had a Mother Teresa with a frail body. We had a Martin Luther King jailed and death threats. All of these things, they continue to clarify their purpose. Can you please, can you please, can somebody please hear me? Stop being so small. Can you please stop allowing things to push you around and get to the point where I clarified I know who I am. Here's the first one. We got to learn to live by faith. Hebrews 10, 38 says the just shall live by faith. Get what Jesus said. Hebrews 10, 38. And any man who draw back 
his soul from me. I will have no pleasure in him. Here's what God is saying. It's, it's not going to be easy. But if you live by faith, you open up a new world of anointing where you're hurting and being blessed, where you're crying and seeing a clear point. Somebody sitting here right now, your only reason you're upset with where you are because you have not clarified your position and clarified the anointing that you possess. God told me to tell you, you from the moment you got saved, you have enough anointing in you to handle any problem that you have. I heard it. I heard it. I declare I heard somebody say they need to hear that again. From the moment you got saved, I don't know what this problem is now. God is not a small time God. He's not a God that just figured out what you need. He placed in you the ability. What I'm telling you this morning and why you tuned in this morning is you can handle and be victorious if you learn to live by faith. Do you know that this concept of faith was so powerful because it's not just in the New Testament. We get confused. This same phrase, the just shall live by faith, was uttered by Habakkuk during the time that the Assyrians and the Babylonians were, were the big bullies on the block and Israel was sinning before God. You know the book of Habakkuk, the prophet Habakkuk, second chapter two, excuse me, verse four says these words. The just shall live by faith. He said, any man who lifts himself up, the lifting up is not of God, and the just shall live by faith. Habakkuk 2 and 4. What am I telling you? All the just shall live by faith means, because Habakkuk wrote this, because he was angry about the people's sin, but he also was angry with God for not showing up and rescuing them. And then he came to a place of conclusion. He said, in darkness or in light, help me somebody, the just shall live by faith. This is repeated in Romans chapter 117. The just shall live by faith. Galatians chapter 3 and 11, chapter 3 verse 11. The just shall live by faith. All I'm trying to say is quit sitting there wanting to act like you can't do it. There's not a thousand Mandela's out there, but that's not who you should be. God placed you here for you to be who he wants you to be. We know that Hebrews 11 and 1 says faith is the substance of things hoped for, evidence of things I've seen. Here's what God is saying. My evidence, your evidence is, and what should make you shout with me this morning, your evidence is you know if I don't know, if we never know, you know the down times in your life, you know the up times, you know the almost given up times, you know what's happening in your life, and yet you're still here. You mean to tell me there wasn't some times that you were just barely holding on by faith and you made it? And you realize nothing else I did could keep me except living by faith. Jesus himself, can I tell you that? Had or didn't, I guess he had to because he modeled it for us. You remember when he went into, uh, on the uh, Palm Sunday, when he did his triumphant ride into Jerusalem? On the way in, he cursed the fig tree. Come on, you remember that? I'm a Bible reader. And when he came back, his disciples were astounded that the tree had died. That's when he uttered that verse, that foundational verse of faith. Here's what he said. Watch this. I love it. Pull, pull away all the hedges. Take away all the smoke screen. The have faith in God. Whoo! There it is. I know. It didn't say have faith in God and don't cry. Have faith in God. Everything will be okay. It says have faith faith in God and whosoever shall speak unto that mountain and say be cast into the sea and believe what he speak he shall have what he says now some of us have turned that into naming and claiming that's Matthew 11 starting at verse 22 but the problem is it's not about naming and claiming it's about the only way I can get a clarification so when the battle comes I'm ready for the battle I'm going to give you three things you write these down it's going to bless you today the first thing Peter and John are going to be our example they're going to show us how flawed people can get to the point that they can look at somebody at a moment when they need to and say such as I have I know what I have do you know what you have the first thing is you got to have a prayer life that's defined uh, a prayer life that's defined so it means you need to understand uh, your prayer life. Secondly, you ought to be a practicing disciple. Prayer life, that's defined. A practicing disciple. And the third thing is you ought to make sure you are participating in the dunamis. Ooh, that's good. Wait till I get there. The dunamis power of God. Participating. Prayer life defined. Practicing disciple. 
participating in the dunamis. I alliterated so you can catch this message. Are you with me? First thing in the prayer life to find, look what it says. Now Peter and John went up together to the temple the ninth hour to pray, being three o'clock. Peter and John, it's interesting that it's Peter and John. Now you know what has taken place in the book of Acts to this point. The Holy Ghost has come. Jesus has been taken back to heaven. Uh, some They all got together and prayed. Ma miracles have happened. But now Peter and John go the ninth hour to the temple to pray. But I want to focus a moment on Peter and John. It meant that Peter and John were two of the special apostles of Christ. They were some of his longest apostles. But you know what's interesting about Peter and John? Jesus would take them where he wouldn't take everybody else. Now watch this. They buddied up, went to the temple to pray. Peter and John were in Jesus' inner circle. He had 12 disciples, but Peter, John, and James were the three that he took with him. I don't know where James was this morning, but Peter is still hanging. Did you hear me? Peter's still hanging out with the inner circle folk. He's not just going astray, hanging out with anybody. The Holy Ghost done came. Peter said, I want to make sure I keep my power. So he's still hanging around. Peter and John. You remember the inner circle? They saw the best times of Jesus. They saw the power of Jesus that the other disciples did not see at the Mount of Transfiguration. He took the inner circle, Peter, James, and John. When he went to raise Jairus' daughter, he took the inner circle, Peter, James, and John. Watch this. And when he went to the Mount uh, to pray, he took Peter, James, and John. And I need you to know that it was Jesus who exposed them to the dark and the best. They were his closest friends. They were the ones he were around. Stop! Lesson time! Watch out who you hang around with when or make sure you don't hang around with folk that don't love God the way you love God. Don't trust God the way you trust God. Aren't looking for God to do anything the way you're looking for God or they will hinder you and block your blessings. This is not just watch out who you hang around with. This is me telling you, watch Jesus himself at 12 and only took three. Something was special about those three. They're the only ones who could see his miracles. Sometimes you got to make sure you're not with the busybodies. You're not with the gossipers. You're not with the negative people. Everything out there, not the negative. Or you got the Mississippi Christians. You know what I'm talking about. I ain't going to believe it until I see it. Stealing stuff from you. All I'm trying to tell you is you got to make sure that you understand who it is you're hanging around. Jesus had 12 disciples. They were all church folk. I like that, but it don't mean you can hang with all church folk. you got to look at their character and see what they are about. Watch this. There was a deacon who had just got done with communion. He took the communion ware to the back of the church. He was looking out of a window. And there he saw this guy named Herbert walking to church. Service was almost halfway over. And he looked out the window. He couldn't believe it because Herbert was his neighbor who he just got out of prison. But he usually catches a ride to church with him, but he didn't come that morning. So he went to the front of the door. He said, Herbert, you just getting to church? How'd you get here? He looked around. There was nothing. He said, did, did you walk all the way here? He said, yeah. He said, that was four miles. He said, I know, I couldn't catch an Uber or a cab, so I walked. I didn't have any money. He said, wait a minute, but you could have went to another church. How many churches did you pass coming here? He said, mm, about 14. You passed 14 other churches. Well, uh, why? He said, well, let me tell you, uh, this church, the people in this church, when I got out of prison, they didn't judge me. They accepted me. They loved me, put me back on the choir. And I've seen some of the other folk who live around me in those other churches. I would walk a hundred miles to be around real church folk who know God. Watch this and show it. Come on, Herbert. Not just knowing God. You, can, you know the people I'm telling you not to hang with? Because no matter what they say, what they are is how they act. What they are. Come on now. You hang around somebody, they like to shout, but they also like to talk about folk. They got all this anointing, but they also nasty as all get out. That's not Christ. You got to make up your mind to be like her. I'd rather walk 100 miles and hang around with somebody who knows God and show it. 
is a Chinese proverb that explains this better than I can. It says, if somebody calls you a donkey or a jackass, which is a donkey, if one person calls you a donkey or a jackass, they only signify. It's talking about you. But if five people call you a donkey, then it's time for you to go out and buy a saddle, put it on your back so folk can ride. Because if they talk like a donkey and walk like a donkey, it is a donkey. So don't let folk tell you, I'm just, I, I got your best back. No, I, I've seen the times you stepped on me. I've seen the times you lied. I've seen the I've seen your character. Then it said they went the ninth hour to pray. I checked. There was no significance to the ninth hour when it came to a feast. There was no significance to the ninth hour in this text. There was too many Jewish traditions for anybody to be sure what that meant. Or it could have just meant what the writer was trying to tell us is that Peter and John were consistent with their prayer life. They were not novices when they prayed. you understand what I'm saying? They understood their prayer life. Here's something I, I tell people that mess them up. All of us know we should pray, but all of us don't pray until we're in need. But this text is trying to show us that they had a consistent prayer life. That prayer is needed constantly if we are going to be whom God called us to be. You have to know that Peter and John displayed they, they, they said they displayed that I came to having a defined prayer life, not by the things that are easy, but by the things I went through. Prayer needs to be done daily. Remember when Jesus' disciples came to him and said, teach us to pray? What did he tell them? Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Give us this day our daily bread. Uh, remember the children of Israel? When they were in the wilderness and God provided fresh manna from heaven, manna meaning what is it? It was like shaped like a bread. And he provided that for them. But here's what Jesus told them. Here's what God told them. You can only pick up today's supply. Don't go out and try to pick up two loaves of manna. Because when you take it back to your house, it's going to stink or it's going to rot. Don't forget that. Uh huh. But if you pick up one, but on but right before the Sabbath, you can take two so you don't work on the Sabbath. That's biblical. But there were some who learned, but if you read the text, some folk just had tents that were full of rot and stinky stuff because they did not try to get daily bread. Bread is daily nourishment for my physical body. Prayer is daily nourishment for my spiritual body. And I can't skip it. And how do you learn how to pray? I love this. You learn how to pray because Peter and John are good examples. Because contrary to what you think, both of them were flawed. Peter, one thing about Peter, he had a good heart. Uh, you can't make something out of nothing if it doesn't want to be made something. Meaning God puts good stuff in us and gives us a fresh start. But we have to want to be better. And Peter learned and John learned how to pray, not just through the joy of praying. We pray because we know we need it. How do we know we need it? Because of what we've been through. Look at what happened. Peter, remember when Jesus went out, they had been fishing all night, and then Jesus came along. These were, you know, professional fishermen, and told them, go back out for another catch. And of course, you know, they were talking. We the fishermen, what is he doing? What is he telling us? And yet they went back out and they caught so many fish, the boat began to sink. They caught so many fish that they had to call people to help them with the nets. The nets broke. But look what happened. It's, it's behind the scenes. But Peter must have been one of the ones griping about it because as soon as that happened in Luke's Gospel, chapter 5, verse 8, he ran over to Jesus, got down on his knees, and said, forgive me, depart from me, I'm a sinful man. That's a good heart. Peter was saying, I'm sorry I didn't listen to you. And Jesus said later, don't worry about it. I'm going to teach you how to be fishers of men. But what I want you to see is Peter's heart was ripe 
for understanding prayer. Peter learned prayer because he had a good heart. Peter learned, so you can't learn if you have a good heart. Peter learned prayer because Jesus chastised him. Come on. We know it. Matthew's Gospel 16, 23. Remember, Peter made the immaculate confession, I call it. Thou art the Christ. Remember that? And then the next few verses, Jesus told him what he had to do. And Peter said, no, that's never going to happen to you. And Jesus had to tell him, get thee behind me, Satan, for you don't cherish the things of God, but the things of men. Do you realize every good saint, in order to learn prayer, has had a top. Don't sit, look at me like that. You've been chastised because you know we're not always right. Thank God he covers up. But Peter learned to pray because that chastisement sent him away. Messed up. And then, of course, in Luke's Gospel, chapter 22, right after they had had the, you know, the Last Supper, the Bible tells us that, you know, Jesus was talking and Peter said, if everybody leave, I'm not leaving. And he told Peter, if before the crow cocks one time, you're going to deny me three times. And, of course, that happened. And I believe what we don't see Peter was so hurt. When it, aren't you hurt when you let God down? Am I the only one to feel bad when you let God down? He was so hurt that he said, Lord, and he ran off. I believe he ran off to pray after denying Christ. But right before that, Jesus had said to him, Simon, Simon, Satan desires to sip you like wheat, but I have prayed for you. I, I think Peter heard that. I'm going to say, Peter learned how to define his prayer life through the chastisement, through the messing up, through the failures, and that's why we pray. John, same thing. John was chastised. Remember him and his brother arguing, uh, Jesus, can I have this seat? Can you have that seat? And Jesus said, no, the greatest, no. Jesus looked at them and said, that's not for me to give, but that's with my father. He had to chastise their heart. I believe John took that. And you also know that when they were at the Last Supper, John was laying on Jesus. It says the disciple that he loved was laying on his shoulder. You know what that means? He loved God so much he learned to pray because he was one of the kind, like some, like me and you. Come on, I know somebody out there like me. I, I need him every day. Some of y'all can play with him. I can't. You know what I'm talking about? I need him. I don't play around, and I know I need him, and I miss him when I'm not with him. And then, lastly, of course, John was given the privilege at the cross of taking care of Jesus' mother. I mean, to tell me they learned how to pray through those situations, through those fellowships, through those times that they had with God. Secondly, the Bible says that and a certain man laid from his mother's womb, they practiced discipleship, uh, was laid there daily. He looked at Peter and John expecting to get something. They said, look on us. Let's stop right there. Look on us. So here's a man that was laying down there beggar and Peter and John had enough sense to stop from going to church to help somebody. We got a whole lot of folk. You go to church. We don't go to church now. You, you keep your religion by your title. You keep your religion by what you think you are and yet the reality is that you have to practice being a disciple through service to God. God expects us to give service. Peter and John, look at what happened to them. They could have went another way, but they clarified in themselves that I have to sell my life for God's life. I got to make sure I give my will for God's will. Practicing discipleship means that sometimes when I'm watching television, when I got another appointment, that some of you, since the pandemic, God can't get you to do anything. What you waiting on? Because you, you don't understand. Real discipleship means I'll do the best I can for God no matter where I am. Peter and John were not strangers to helping is what I'm saying to you. They were servants. God has three kinds of servants. Three kinds of servants. There is uh, the ones who serve him out of fear. You know, they strictly serve out of fear. Uh, there are others who serve him because they're hirelings. They serve him for what they can get. And then there's some that serve him because we love him. And I'm hurt. I don't, I don't serve him to get stuff. I serve him because that's who I am. I've clarified my position on this earth so the power and the anointing can flow through me. They practice discipleship. Service is where the blessing is. What are you talking about? 
there was the disciples came to Jesus and said, the scribes and the Pharisees, as he was teaching the, the, the crowds, that he was they were telling about the power of the scribes and Pharisees. And Jesus said, wait a minute, the scribes and the Pharisees desire Moses' seat. They want to be called rabbi in the streets. They, they like their titles. They, they, you know, we, that's what I live off of. Call me by my title. They live off of stuff that has nothing to do with service. I want people to know how annoyed I am by the clothes I wear. No. And Jesus looked and said, don't be like them. Don't be many masters. The greatest of you will be a servant of all. The greatest one is the servant. And I love God because that's what's great in God when we take on service. There was a farmer who was sitting on his porch with his feet up looking at his poorly grown crops. And just as he was sitting there thinking, along came a magazine salesman on farm products and how to grow better crops. He looked at this man and said, you need to buy this magazine. The farmer said, no, 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 I don't need a magazine. He said, wait a minute. This magazine has articles to tell you how to grow the best crops. The farmer stopped him again and said, wait a minute. I'm not even farming as good as I know how to do now. That book won't do me no good. Do you realize when we talk about service, some of you have the attitude you hear service and turn right off because you're not even acting on the things you already know about serving. Don't you cut me off. Service is what makes us like God. Service brings us to greatness of God. What am I talking about? Jesus said, not my will in Gethsemane, but your will be done. See, here's what real service is. Trading off what I want sometimes. Sometimes for what God wants. We act like we're doing something, we do what God wants. And we want God to stop in the middle of heaven to shower down a strong anointing. But we won't even give service. Figure it out. You figure out everything else. Figure out how to serve God because service makes you like God. And I need you to understand something. When you are great like God, when you understand that service makes you great, then you find yourself doing what Jesus did. Jesus said in John 14, verse 12, the works that I do, you can do and greater works. How do I do it? Watch me. Jesus was about to go to the cross. He could have fasted. He could have prayed. He could have done anything. But the Bible said, suffer being ended. He grabbed a towel and a basin and started washing people's See, that was a blessing. I'm not there yet. That was a blessing. Started washing people's feet. Peter said, don't wash my feet. We got to get there. He said, I'm going to show you how to tap into eternal power. Serve. Somebody sitting there right now. I need a blessing. Serve. Uh, somebody sitting there right now. I need my child to be better. I need my finance to be better. Serve. When somebody calls you from the church, quit saying no and figure out how to serve. Put your mask on. You put it on everywhere else and serve and watch God bless you. Here is the last part of this text. I'm going to the end. Participate in the dutimus. Look what happened. Peter and John said, silver and gold I don't have. Tried money. Tried things. Cars, money, things never helped me. But what I do have, what I possess, this power I've been working with, how did he know it was his power? He said, because I've defined my prayer life. I got a prayer life made on my experiences and the trouble and the stuff. When I pray, something happened because I prayed out of something happening. And then I've already practiced my discipleship. I can't help but run and serve God and be a good disciple. And now when I speak, I can go boldly. To the throne of God. I got power. The word there is dunamis. It means an exploding power of God. It means when the words come out of my mouth, they are words that are soaked in an anointing. When you serve, when you pray, an anointing comes out of you that can raise up the biggest demon. And that dunamis power tells me I got power for finances, power for healing, power for my mind, power for sleeping, power for peace, power 
to move obstacles. Power to get the devil out of my life. Power to get the enemy out of my children's life. Power. I got power. Somebody say power. You got enough power right now when you clarify it to handle anything you're going through. Seek power. Now, that's why God said we can go boldly to the throne of grace. Take me out of here right now. Watch this. Power. Remember, the Holy Ghost had come. Acts chapter 2. I believe Peter and John, when they said, I'm going to give you what I possess. They remember, Jesus said, and you shall receive how? Oh, can I ask you a question? Where's yours? Have you clarified it? Have you sat down and said, I speak too negatively. I've let all this stuff get on my nerves. That's because you have to clarify the power you possess in order to use it. Quit being a maybe so, hope so, maybe, if. Quit it. Clarify and be bold like Peter and John. Such as I have, I give unto you. Anybody who prayed, that's how they talk. David stood before a giant Goliath and said, you're going to fall. Your head going to roll. Why? He had been praying with God and he had been practicing disciples. It was defined. He knew who he was. When Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego saw that King Nebuchadnezzar built the eye, he said, look, I know you got your big statue. I know you're talking about the furnace, but I ain't bad. Matter of fact, my God is able. If he delivered me, good. If he doesn't, I'm still not bad. Because I've been with him. And I know who he is. When you clarify, you know the prayer you pray is not coming from you. Look what they said. Such as I have in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. That's where I anchor my power. In Jesus. I know when I pray it works. Peter and John didn't even pray. Matter of fact, the text says Peter grabbed him and stood him up. He said, I know what I pray it works. <laughs> and he started jumping and praising and leaping. Because when you clarify what you possess, you stop crying, you stop whining, you stop worrying. Focus on knowing who you are, what you replaced it for, and watch the power spring up in your life. God bless you. If you want to give to our ministry, there's several ways to get. Just go on our website, www.shadow Baptist Church. Go on and just see the things that we're doing. And you know this is good ground to sow in. And also, I like to pray this prayer for someone as I close today. Father God, repeat these words with me. Say, Father God, I'm a sinner, but I need that power. Help me now. I believe you died and rose again. Because I believe it. Say this. I am saved. This is Pastor Duncan. I hope you enjoyed this message. Clarify the power you possess and you're going to find yourself going to a new level, a new dimension. See you next time. I was down, but with no way up, and I needed some help. Everybody breathing, but not living, just existing. Well, and I needed some help. Somebody told me that Jesus will set you free. What he did